Released in 1997, 007 Tomorrow Never Dies had the impossible task of following up what many consider to be one of the greatest James Bond movies ever made, Goldeneye. Goldeneye gained a cult following and inducted many new fans into the James Bond franchise and continued making a wave in the world even the year Tomorrow Never Dies was set to release. The widely acclaimed game, Goldeneye 007, launched on the Nintendo 64 this same year in August of 1997, just four months prior to the planned December 1997 release of Tomorrow Never Dies, and in hindsight, I believe Tomorrow Never Dies was put in a self-defeating position by Goldeneye, which had started to become its own sub-brand outside of 007, and was now forcing the next movie to try and live up to this cultural phenomenon. We actually made a review on the Goldeneye movie, so if you're interested in that, be sure to check it out after this review. It's definitely one of my favorite Bond movies. But Tomorrow Never Dies tried its own hand at a video game just a few years later in 1999. However, like its namesake movie, it couldn't seem to make it past the shadow of Goldeneye opting for a somewhat clunky but different third-person shooter game, which didn't do much to push forward the video game industry, unlike the technical marvel that was Rare's GoldenEye 007 game. Forced to climb out of the pit of greatness that GoldenEye dug the franchise into and try and make its own identity, Tomorrow Never Dies launched with flashier action scenes, their own take on the infamous tank scene, and the stunning and dangerous Wei Lin, played by Michelle Yeoh, who I still have a crush on to this day. Seriously, I would still love to take this woman out to dinner. She is gorgeous, and she kicked ass in the movie. Waylin remains one of my favorite Bond characters of all time, despite the fact that this is the only time we get to see her, and this movie was willing to take risks, making the villain a mass media mogul and tackling the concept of fake news or created and manufactured news before it was a buzzword in modern 21st century politics. The movie follows Elliot Carver, a villain who creates tragedies in order to further his own media empire by reporting on them. The reviews for this movie at its launch and over the years mainly consist of one sentiment, but it's not quite Goldeneye. The movie did take risks, with this being the first time since Dr. No that the signature Bond gun actually changed, going from the Walther PPK to the P99, while the movie also strived to create a Bond girl that the creators described as an attempt at Bond's equal. Another change this movie made was music composition, as this was the first 007 film with David Arnold as the composer, who would go on to compose Bond movies all the way through Quantum of Solace. One extreme oddity about this movie, before our review even officially starts and Jill and I get into our full-on discussion, is that it's somehow more culturally relevant now than ever before, as millions across the world have lost faith in news media and have caught on to the various political and other biases held by corporate news companies all over the globe, with vested interests in reporting the news in very specific and certain ways across the board. In hindsight, I believe that if this same plot of a movie came out now with this same level of quality, it would be seen as extremely relevant to the modern world which makes Tomorrow Never Dies in many ways a movie ahead of its time. With bigger action scenes, an even more badass Bond girl who could practically carry her own film, and an incredible slew of gadgets that never felt contrived or too convenient for our belief. Jill, this is your second James Bond movie with one of the goats, Pierce Brosnan. Overall, you know, before we even hop into the details, what did you think? Because I remember after the movie, you looked at me and said, People really don't like that as much as Goldeneye. I thought it was just as fun, you know. And we and we talked about that for a little while. I thought that was an interesting reaction because you've never, you've never experienced all of the uh, people's opinions around these movies. You no. know, you're completely separated from that. Yeah, I, my family was never big on James Bond. I don't think I never went to see any of the movies when they were coming out or anything like that. As soon as I watched like the very beginning, it was so fun, and yeah, I don't know, it was very like heart pumping and exciting and I felt like it was more exciting than um, the beginning of Goldeneye and for me I, it kind of immediately sucked me into the movie not that I didn't like Goldeneye I loved that movie but I felt like this movie was extremely interesting um, right from the get-go whereas for probably the first like five to ten minutes of Goldeneye, I needed some like easing into it because I wasn't really sure what was going on. Mm -hmm. I found that really fun in this movie and then I just really enjoyed all of the action. I felt like it was much more action oriented. Things were very um, realistic looking because of all of the practical effects and it just made me really love the movie a lot. Well and speaking of those practical effects, we watched the World of 007 hosted by Q 
which I believe the way to say his name, and I, I feel bad about this, is Desmond L- Llewellyn. Mm-hmm. It's an interestingly spelled last name. He's a legend of Bond. I have never really gone in depth until these reviews, though, in terms of like going in and like looking at the actors, seeing things they've been in, listening to their interviews. That's something we've been trying to do with these movie reviews to kind of know more about the franchise versus just what's on screen. But in terms of what's on screen, I did want to say I actually like this movie just as much as Goldeneye as well. Yeah, I liked this movie just as much. And I really liked that in the behind the scenes stuff, Q was in character the whole time. And he called everybody who worked on the movie a secret agent. Yeah, I thought it was fun. It was very fun. He very clearly has a fun time with his part. But in terms of the opening, I also thought that it was interesting. You know, they used real life models to actually coordinate these stunts and they used real life airplanes and actually flew those planes in order to do aircraft stunt work. So things look real in this to me. Um, at least most things we will get to some stuff that didn't. But like the stunts, I think in this movie, everything everything felt very well done and real even Mm -hmm. though it is some out of this world action like jumping off a high-rise building and surviving or you know flying halo jump or doing the halo jump or flying but what's interesting about that is there are people who can do these things in real life yeah which we're going to get to it's very cool it it was absolutely incredible watching uh, the part in the behind the scenes where all of the actors were standing watching this guy get on a motorcycle and he was like, yeah, I think I can do this jump. Why not? And everybody was like, no, we can just do it in the computer. Don't do the jump. Yeah. And he was like, I'm going to do the jump. And I think that that's something that's really cool about this movie is that everywhere they could do something for real in real life, they did. And you pointed out that outside of this franchise, I will also say Mission Impossible. I don't want to go off topic. I'm not a big Tom Cruise fan Mm -hmm. for my own reasons. Mm -hmm. Mission Impossible and Bond though, they both try and do everything they can with real people Mm -hmm. and real stunts, Mm -hmm. even to this day. Yeah, which is awesome. That's something I really respect. I think it makes movies like this age a lot better. And it makes them more special in my opinion. And speaking of aging, and I do agree with you, this movie ages very well with its humor, I think. It it has one of my favorite recurring jokes in it. It only happens twice. Maybe it would have been too much if it happened more than that, but Bond's lighter. Yeah, where... in the very beginning of the movie, he uh, lights a guy's cigarette, and then doesn't he kill him or punch him or something? Yeah, he just knocks him out. He punches him. And, and then that happens again. <laughs> yeah, and then later on in the movie, when he's going to help Wei Lin, he pretends that he has a lighter, And then he does like the, I got nothing in my hands and then punches the guy in the face, which I thought that was really funny. You know, with this movie, I think talking about kind of how it relates to now and everything, the music felt really tied into the movie, especially in the intro. Now, GoldenEye's intro is iconic because it's from GoldenEye. Mm -hmm. I personally think this movie has a better musical card like like a title card. Right? I, I loved the title card. It was really awesome because like, it's it's full of uh, not only sexy ladies, of course. You've mm-hmm. got the sexy ladies and the guns, which are staples, but it's also very tied into the movie because it's not just a yeah, just make a song about a golden eye. Um, right. We can't tell you anything else. So just do that. Whereas this one is like, it's got TV screens and it's actually like about the media and all of those subplots that are in the movie. And I thought it was really interesting. I thought so too. And I thought that with that, it, it yeah, it tied so well into the movie. I think better than GoldenEye's title card did. Mm-hmm. I love all the title cards for Pierce Brosnan's Bond. I don't love Die Another Days, which again, we'll get to, because that one was a Madonna song that didn't fit. I've never been a huge fan of Madonna. I like her fine, but like I, I just don't think it fit that movie, whereas I thought this fit the movie perfectly, and I thought it really set the tone. You start out with an explosive opening, tons of action, everything going on, Bond wisecracking. Uh, the Bond wisecracks in this are just great. They're things, perfect. Things like where the guy tries to choke him from behind in the in the fighter jet and he like ejects him into the other one and calls him a backseat driver. Yes. Like he's got all of that charm and charisma and and humor again. I really think that this movie in general, it takes a lot of the stuff GoldenEye does and I thought it did it just as well, but in different ways. I don't personally think this movie is better than GoldenEye, but I don't think it's much worse either. GoldenEye got so much praise because it was using 006. It was using a former MI6 agent. It was trying something really newish. 
this movie was trying something with like fake news and all mm -hmm. this stuff. And at the time this movie came out, that was not a big cultural discussion. Yeah, now it, was, it is. It was really ahead of its time. And I do agree. Like, I think the sexy ballad that they had really set the tone well for the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the rest of the movie kind of revolves around some strong women like Wei Lin in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and it has them help more and kind of be badass or at least mostly Waylon, rather than just having uh, 007 be on his own, which I thought was really well done, just like they did in Goldeneye, only I felt like Waylon was even more of an action star than, um, what was her name, Na Natasha or Natalia? Natalia. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought so too. I thought Natalia and Waylon are both incredibly strong. Paris is cool. I do want to talk about Paris for a second, because mm -hmm. this movie, again, there were previous movies, especially in the Connery era, where they would kind of reference each other, you know, back and forth. One thing I like about this movie is it tried to break the mold of not doing that, which Bond was doing for a little while, where every single one felt like a standalone. It was like, oh, we'll just reference a throwaway line to something you did in the past, but we didn't see it on screen, right? Mm -hmm. One thing I like about this movie is that he straight up meets a previous love interest he had, Paris, mm -hmm. and they kind of get into the background of that, and they actually show something I didn't remember when it, from when I was a kid and I watched this movie, which is there is emotional vulnerability to the Pierce Brosnan bond. It's just not seen that often because mm -hmm. you see it a lot with Craig because his movies are tied together a lot in terms of like a movie saga. The Brosnan movies are still juggling the idea between that and episodic, you know, like a, a serial cartoon uh, on Saturday where it doesn't necessarily reference last Saturday, you know? Yeah. And I thought the idea of bringing Paris in, who was played by Terry Hatcher, was really cool where she actually was this person who got close to Bond and she even says, you know, why did you leave? Did I get too close? Like, did I get too close to you? It really and, humanized him. And he said, yeah, you did. Yeah. You know, and, and I, yeah, I thought that was really humanizing for him because... And he was really upset when she, you know... Died. Yeah. yeah. I, I wasn't sure if I could say it. No, you can. I mean, I'm, I am I think that it's really interesting because they did a lot of humanization of the, of the Pierce Brosnan bond in this movie to me more than Goldeneye did. You know, there was a little bit more of like lifting up that mask and seeing the guy underneath. Yeah. And even seeing concern in him too. Like he's concerned a little bit and intrigued when he's looking at what happened to like the British soldiers. Yeah. And kind of looking over it. Like I think Pierce did more facial expressions in this movie uh -huh. that humanized him. Another was when he jumps out of the high rise screaming. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's something that would scare you. You wouldn't just be like, whatever. You know? Even though he did a halo jump, but he wasn't nearly as scared because he was prepared for that, which I thought was interesting. He has this composure still, but there's some times where things catch him off guard or really hit him in the feelings, where you can kind of see a little bit more of the human underneath rather than just an MI6 agent. And a, a line I really liked, not to take this off course, in Goldeneye that references that is when he basically attacks Alec's character and says, you're just a thief. Like, mm -hmm. you know, with all these fancy gadgets, you're just a common bank robber mm -hmm. because of what he wanted to do. And Alec's like, oh, don't try and psychoanalyze me. I might as well turn to you and say, do all the tequila and women you sleep with help ease the pain at night? Oh, and you kind of see you kind of see Bond kind of grimace at him. And you kind of see that there's that under the mask, you know, like a jab that does kind of hit home there. Mm -hmm. Something I like about this movie is that I feel like that emotional vulnerability is more shown, but he's still this larger than life character. You yeah. know, they don't lose what makes him James Bond just by showing he's also a person. Yeah, and I, I really like that. You mentioned the halo jump. I do want to say really quick that they got a professional halo jumper, BJ Worth, to actually perform that skydive. Yeah, that was awesome. It was really awesome. Which lends to the credibility of this looking real. And speaking of stunts, Michelle Yeoh, she actually, along with Pierce Brosnan, they did as many of their own stunts as they could. She was more used to doing all of her own stunts. Mm -hmm. And I think that added to the realism of the movie too, um, because she had been in a bunch of action movies before. And part of the reason she was cast was her martial arts background. Yeah. So I, I thought all of that stuff was cool. And yeah, she was amazing in this movie. She was probably one of my favorite characters and I want her to be in another Bond movie, but yeah. I sadly don't think she ever will be. I don't want to make this a die another day smear piece because there is some stuff I like in that movie too. Waylin should have come back in that movie because with yeah. Waylin, you know, you talked about it. She's incredibly sexy. 
She's incredibly strong. She's James Bond's equal in a lot of ways. Yeah, and they and they even talked about that in the world of 007, that they tried to design her to be an equal to Bond. Yeah. Um, there are a few decisions I didn't love with her where they kept having her get grabbed, yeah. which annoyed me a little bit because I think she gets grabbed by a villain about three times in the movie. Mm -hmm. And that frustrated me, not to sound like the world's hugest feminist, but like you see what Waylon is capable of. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it annoyed me that like, you know, Carver would have a gun to her head or someone would have a gun to her head. Or she almost drowned, even though like, I feel like she or James Bond would have easily been able to get out of that sort of trap. There were, yeah, there were a couple things with Waylon that bothered me in terms of that. But overall, I love her in terms of her inclusion. Do you want to talk a little bit more about her here? Um, I did want to mention that I really loved her introduction, how mm -hmm. you had no idea that she was a Chinese agent at all and that she just kind of came in and was very suave and when she started talking to Carver in that kind of way that she had about her I kind of thought to myself huh is there more to her than just being a news person mm -hmm. it was really interesting and speaking of that party I really liked that all of the extras or at least a lot of them in the background were wearing like newspaper themed outfit outfits it was really cool because it's like they're um, at a media place sort of thing I don't know I thought, I thought that was a cool touch I like that they were very nitpicky about all the touches that they could be in the movie but in terms of Wei Lin I did want to add on to this just a little bit I think that she is a standout inclusion in this movie that makes the movie feel more special this is the kind of character that when people say they want diversity that I want to see mm -hmm. you know like I don't want to see a character who is like ham-fisted into a movie or a show or a book just to be there mm -hmm. I want to see someone who contributes yeah. someone who matters and the thing I like about Wei Lin is that she contributes she matters but she's not just being James Bond you know she's not just James Bond but Asian does that right. make sense right and she does have her own quirks and interesting bits about her and on top of all of that Michelle Yeoh played the part just so well and and really stood out and I think that She's someone who could practically carry a movie on her own. Uh -huh. We talked about that a bit. I know the Bond fandom is not a fan of the idea of spinoff movies. Mostly, I'm not either. Uh, but at the very least, she should have been back in a movie like Die Another Day. I agree. They try and write in a character in that movie named Jinx, who feels a lot like Wei Lin, but less interesting. Oh. And it to me, it was kind of like, well, that you missed the perfect opportunity to bring her back there. Mm -hmm. Because, they, you know... I think, though, it does say something positive about this movie and Goldeneye that both of the, you know, Bond pro Bond girl protagonists in those, Natalia and Wei Lin, I wanted to see back for another movie. Yeah, somewhere. because they were awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. So Elliot Carver is the villain of this movie. He's played by Jonathan Price. Pretty much to sum up his plan, it's that he wants to create tragedies to report on them. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wants to cause bad things to happen. And then his media empire gets out there first with all the details first and he makes a ton of money. Yeah, but nobody somehow suspects that like he has all of the details before even the police do. Well, and that's the problem is they suspect it immediately. Like, yeah, like exactly. the police don't expect it and nobody nobody else suspects it. But then M is just like, how'd this douchebag yeah. write all this stuff in his paper about all our people dying yeah. early on? Like that doesn't make any sense. It, and Bond's just like, yeah, that makes no sense. It wasn't a great plan. They like were onto him immediately. Um, he also is Jeeves Stobbs, in my opinion. Yeah, he looks like evil Steve Jobs. It's weird. Yeah, it, it is very odd. Like, it's very obvious they, like, tried to base his character, I guess, on an evil Steve Jobs. Yeah. Which he, is, he's, like... He's even got, like, almost the turtleneck look. It's, like, an interesting point that they were trying to make, and I think that they did some really interesting stuff with talking about how the media can be run kind of evilly, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, like a corporation. Yeah, and, and you know, you'll, profit. You'll have, like, these few people at the top who own these two media companies, and then those companies will own, like, five networks under them, and those networks will own, like, ten newspapers. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a really creepy deep Deep dive, go try and figure out everything Nestle owns. It's insanity. Oh my. Like when you start looking at like everything Nestle owns or everything Disney owns, you know, it's that kind of point of like you don't want all this power in one hand, right? And I thought that that was interesting with Carver, but there are questions that happen with his villain that I didn't have as much with Goldeneye. Mm -hmm. You know, like where it's like Alex's plan seemed a lot more clear cut. It was for his benefit, mm -hmm. it would hurt England. And, and get them, mm -hmm. but mainly it would make him rich, and mm -hmm. it was a self-serving plan. Yeah. 
Carver's plan has a lot of moving pieces that could very easily get messed up and do. And so like, for example, he commissions and builds like one of the world's first stealth ships in order to do his plan, right? Which is probably costing him more money than he's going to make off of these newspapers. It would be probably billions of dollars. Yeah. And um, because like it was experimental technology and everything, essentially his plan's very complicated. Do I think it's more complicated than a lot of classic Bond villains who get a pass? No. You know, and that, that's kind of to me where I defend it, is that if you want to shit on this movie for Carver and his plan being very complex, I think you have to go back and start doing the same for some of the Connery era villains or the, you know, Roger Moore era villains. Like there's always been this cartoonish, larger than life villain across mm -hmm. from James Bond too. I, I don't get why this movie gets attacked for that when other ones don't. I just didn't understand like what his end plan would give him. Does that make sense? Like, I don't understand, like, what he was getting out of it. Well, he he was going to get exclusive broadcasting and rights in China for, like, a hundred years. He was going to get billions of dollars, and essentially, he was going to be the one on the, on the forefront controlling what happened with politics. Mm -hmm. So, like, he was going to be the guy who was behind the scenes kind of controlling everything. Like feeling like he was a king, I guess, like an ego trip. Right, and that's what it is, is he's an, a megalomaniac. However, I've also seen it pointed out in other people's reviews that the nuclear fallout from his plan, like if he caused World War III, would wipe out a lot of viewership. Oh. Like it would wipe out a lot of the people that he wants to control. And he didn't think about that, did he? It didn't seem like he cared. Weird. So, so it's a little odd because like if you start a nuclear war basically between China and Britain, right, and the uh -huh. UK, uh -huh. uh, that's going to drag in other countries. Like America. And who's to say some Carver building that he's in doesn't get nuked in the meantime? You know, so it's like, it's one of those plans where it was such a larger than life plan. He's an interesting villain. Yeah, he's not the brightest bulb on the block, which I think is interesting because I like when villains have flaws, mm -hmm. too. You know, what did you think about the cut scenes? Because I thought that they cast Ricky Jay to play Gupta. I think that's his name. I yes, always get it wrong. Gupta. Um, and he was actually cast partially because of his world-renowned ability to throw cards. You know, he was a card thrower and he could like cut things in half or stick them in walls and they ended up cutting scenes where he did that. Yeah, he cut all of, they cut all of the scenes where he did that. And I didn't understand it because if you put both those scenes back in the movie, it would have added maybe like 30 seconds to a minute. Mm -hmm. And I don't get, like they added a lot to his character. I thought they were interesting and fun. And then wasn't there also a scene too with Q mm -hmm. um, where there's randomly a jaguar in the background of the scene? Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there and I was like, why is there a jaguar in the back of this scene? And then we watched that like behind the scenes thing and they showed the cut scene of Q making a silly joke um, where he opens up the crate and he's like, this is your new car and it's a Jaguar and yeah. they make a joke about it. And then they go on to the next thing where it's like his actual car, it's at a BMW. Yeah, he opened up the wrong shipping container. Yeah, and there was just a Jaguar in the, the back the whole time. And without that scene, it just kind of made everything kind of not flow, I guess, in my opinion. And it, it, it felt very odd and like a random decision to just not include that very short, actually really funny joke. I'm a little confused as to why they cut some of the scenes they did. I think Goldeneye flows really well. Mm -hmm. And when you watch the scenes, some of them could fit, some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. A lot of the scenes of Tomorrow Never Dies added maybe 15, 20, 30 seconds max uh -huh. and fit in, in the movie. And, you know, for someone like Gupta, he's pretty forgettable. You know, they, you cast Ricky Jay to play this character and he's supposed to be this hacker dude who's like really known for hacking, but also he throws these playing cards and that's his dumb gimmick, okay? Yeah. There's a lot of Bond villains with dumb gimmicks. Kind of like Goats Otto, I think that's how you say his name, who was cast as Stamper and he was supposed to be this, you know, stereotypical uh, German torturer, a uh, big villain and he was kind of under Carver and they cast him for that part and he got to keep pretty much his entire gimmick. Yeah, and even Carver at one point says a line like, so much for German muscle about yeah. him, which I thought was funny. Yeah, it's and, like, but they don't let Ricky Jay keep his gimmick, so he just ends up as a throwaway hacker character who gets executed by the main villain. And then he's the, the most boring villain out of all of them, in my opinion. Out of like, all three, yeah. Even the guy who has all of the special knives and stuff and is like, um, 
talking about how he's embarrassed. Oh, Dr. He, Kaufman, yeah. Yeah, he's talking about how he's embarrassed because he has to ask him how to open up the car, like James Bond, before he kills him and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I thought it was really fun, and that was a really memorable scene to me. But then they got rid of all of the memorable scenes with Gupta in it, and it kind of felt to me like, well, why'd you even hire this magician guy to be in the movie then? You could have hired any old dude to do this. Right, yeah, it feels a little unfair to him. Yeah, and disrespectful. But I do want to say, too, that with this movie, to add on to, you know, some of the positives, that this movie did something way better than Goldeneye, in my opinion, because there was a scene, there was something that was really missing in Goldeneye, and that was a Bond signature car. Mm -hmm. There's really no signature car. They went a totally different direction. They used the tank, and I love it. They did mention the signature car, and then he drove it in one scene with Natalia and didn't use any of the gadgets And he gives it. it to Jack Wade. Yeah. And then Jack Wade drives off with it, and that's it. Who yeah. I'm, I am glad Jack Wade returned in this, by the way, in a small I role. love when he calls him Jimbo. It's fun. Um, but this movie, I think, did a really good job with the whole signature car stuff twice because they do have his remote control car, which I think is one of the best things ever where, you know, he's- It was awesome. That scene was incredible. And he's jumping in the back seat and he's using it and he's using like smoke bombs and he's using missiles and stuff out of this car. Unpopular opinion. I liked that scene more than the tank scene. Wow. Yeah. For me, they're pretty much equal, but I love them both. But another thing I saw that's really cool is they actually gave him a motorcycle that hadn't even hit the public yet. Mm -hmm. The motorcycle that he drove, um, it was, you know, it was like a, a showcase for that motorcycle was to put it on screen and show it off because it hadn't even been rolled off the line for general public buying yet. Mm -hmm. And I thought that kind of stuff was really cool because they basically were giving him these larger than life vehicles again too. The tank is so cool and it's its own thing. And I think it'll always stand out. But, you know, when you watch the documentary on it too, they actually tried to do the opposite because one of the directors was like, you know, we couldn't give him something bigger than a tank. That would be ridiculous. What would we give him? So we tried the opposite. We put him in a very vulnerable position on a motorcycle tied to Wei Lin. Yeah. And I thought that that was really cool was like they didn't try and be Goldeneye with this movie. And I think this movie would have really suffered if they tried to be Goldeneye. Yeah, I like that it tried to be its own thing. That was something I really loved about it. And speaking of the motorcycle scene, can I finally bring up the thing about the arm? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so I don't know. I I don't think very many people ever noticed this. I could have been the first one. Who knows? But... Not, not in the world. I'm sure you weren't. <laughs> but I was watching this movie. And I saw Wayland on the back of the motorcycle, and I was like, these are really cool scenes. I'm really liking this. But why is her arm so long? Why is it, like, freakishly long here? And I'm sure you'll roll a little bit of the footage of what I'm talking about, but I asked you about it, and I was like, why does it look like her arm is, like, long and broken? And you were like, what are you talking about? And I made you back up the movie um, to see, like, these really weird scenes where they used a fake arm attached to the handle of the motorcycle, but she was way too far back on the motorcycle, so it just looked like she had a Slenderman arm that was broken. Mm -hmm. And it was really badly done, and you could see it really clearly on Blu-ray. But as this movie has gotten clearer, I think that the motorcycle scene actually suffers a lot from that because you can see it. There are rumors that supposedly we are getting 4K of the Brosnan era next year. I'd and, love that. And of some of the other eras, like during 2023, but... But the arm scene is going to look bad in that. In 4K, oh my. Yeah, so that's that's an unfortunate thing about movie making. It's kind of like Alien now. You can see some of the... Um, you can see some of the places where it looks like a suit. Yeah, the clearer it gets, like now in 4K. But overall, I still think it looks a lot better than trying to CGI that stuff. Yeah, I think that was probably the one practical effect in this movie that I thought was badly done. Mm -hmm. They should have just had her have her arm on the other side and had James Bond on the outside, like towards the camera, so you couldn't see that at all. Yeah, because he, he's a man and he has a longer arm. Yeah, and you would have been, been able to keep that illusion of like, oh yeah, she's definitely holding on to the, the motorcycle over there. I know I mentioned the composition in the intro i love the composition like how they play certain things and it was really done intentionally like during the remote control car scene i didn't notice how incredibly done the music was until the musician guy started talking about it and all of these thoughts that he had doing it and like him specifically putting like the twangy guitar as soon as he does one specific thing in, a, in the movie like in a scene and it was really interesting to kind of like hear about that progression uh, especially from the mind of a musician that I just can't understand because I can't wrap my head around like 
what these guys think with music. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was really awesome and it made me appreciate the music more. And I really liked that. So it's like overall, I don't think there's a lot we didn't like about this movie. No, I loved this movie a lot. It was one of my favorite movies I've probably ever seen, actually. Like for action movies. Mm -hmm. I loved it too. I think, you know, just a few things to mention, uh, you know, in closing, I wish M appeared in the movie a little bit more. I think she deserved to be in the movie a little yeah. bit more. I wish Miss Money Penny was also in the movie a little more. You know, overall, I think that this movie, though, does highlight some missed opportunities with the Brosnan era in terms of introducing really cool characters that never return. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's probably my biggest criticism of Goldeneye in this is why are you creating such a good character in someone like Natalia or someone like, you know, Wei Lin? Mm -hmm. And then you just drop them after the movie. Because I know that the the idea was always you have your signature Bond girl and then she leaves. But I do also think that the Craig era proved, you know, later on by being a little more experimental that you didn't necessarily have to stick to that formula. A lot of the criticisms of this movie are that it goes very much back to the staples of Bond, whereas Goldeneye did them, but also really tried to stand apart in terms of reviving the franchise. Overall, I really like this movie. I enjoy it just as much as Goldeneye. I think Goldeneye as a film on its own, it stands the test of time a little better just because like, it introduced that bond you didn't it wasn't really a sequel it was its own thing and it tried really hard to revive the franchise but i think it's unfortunate that people use goldeneye being so good as an excuse to put down tomorrow never dies in closing i know that pierce brosnan is the only james bond i have seen so far but i am in love with him and he's personally my favorite at this point in time and i am really excited to see the rest of his movies yeah, I think he's great. I think that it's too bad he gets such a he gets so much criticism for the writing of tomorrow of like Tomorrow Never Dies through Die Another Day, but I personally don't think this movie or the world is not enough really have much worse writing than some of the earlier Bond movies. You yeah, know? I, I really loved it. It was awesome. I just think they get a lot of flack because they come after one of the best Bond movies ever, which is Goldeneye. Mm. And that's just unfortunate to me. But let me know what you think in the comments down below. You know, did you enjoy this movie? Did you not? What are your thoughts on Tomorrow Never Dies? Uh, I really don't like the video game, but I like the movie, so... Yeah, the video game's not great. Not no. great. We might talk about that in the future. Yeah. So let us know what you think in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Our Bond videos, it's really hard to gain traction and for people to see them. I know there's a lot of dedicated Bond channels, but because we're more of a variety channel, it's hard for people to actually see when we upload these. So we appreciate you engaging, leaving a like, subscribing, letting us know your opinion in the comments down below and stuff like that. And also, in closing, you know, it's getting close to Christmas now. And Jill, you've been working really hard on stuff over on our website, EnchantedGlamour.com, which is G-L-A-M-O-R.com. And we also have now the domain DegenerateJStore.com. We also have MagicalJill.com and DegenerateJ.com. Oh, really? We bought in like four? Yeah, we bought all those too. Oh, I forgot. So yeah, now we have all of those. So you can pretty much type those in. Um, do not go to EnchantedGlamour with a U.com. That one's an unsavory site. Yeah, uh, we, somebody we, bought that after we made ours, I think. We don't support that. I was going to buy Enchanted Glamour with a U, but I couldn't because of them. So so that was pretty bad. Check out my Christmas collection at this point in the month. I can't guarantee that it will get to you by Christmas, but it is some pretty awesome stuff. It could get to you by Christmas too, which is January 15th. Exactly. Um, but a lot of people did buy my Christmas stuff and it should be getting to them by then and I'm very excited about it. So you guys are going to have to check that out and definitely be kind of around next Christmas too for my stuff to come back because I might be making more and it'll be very fun. We hope you all have a fantastic day. As always everyone, stay, stay shway. shway.